Folks here, I see some mostly familiar faces, some I don't see here all that often. I know that Tim has his cousin, cousin with him today. Grateful to have you here, but I'm grateful to see all of y'all. Thank you for coming. And um, this year in church, I've been preaching messages about exalting, lifting up Jesus Christ. And I, I used this kind of a launching point in John chapter 12. Jesus had just entered into the, the um, city of Jerusalem, and um, he was there for. Passover feast, and there were some Greeks that ended up coming up to the disciples and says, we want to see Jesus. Well, they eventually found Jesus, and Jesus ended up saying to the people that he was speaking to, he says, um, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all people to myself. Of course, he was speaking about his death, his death on the cross, that if he was raised on that cross. But I saw in that an opportunity to preach messages about that if we do lift up Jesus Christ, people will be drawn to him. And that should be our goal, is that people be drawn to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do believe that Jesus came and he lived among us and he died for our sins so that we could go to heaven. I, we as Christians don't believe that this life is all that there is. We believe that there is much more. That God created us for eternity. And I, I pray that people might come to believe in Jesus because Jesus wanted people to believe in him. He wanted them to know that he really is the Son of God. Um, so this morning, I'm, I'm going to go to probably a familiar passage of Scripture. John chapter 3 is going to be where I'm taking my text from. For those of you that are acquainted with the Bible, what is John chapter 3 about? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Who's Nicodemus? I'm a teacher of what? Teacher of Pharisee. Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. Some people say, well, why do we need to go through this? Folks, we need to lift up Jesus Christ and tell people they can be saved. I was telling the Sunday school class this morning that last night, I don't know, here a week or so ago, I saw, I get all sorts of emails on my phone. I received an email from Voice of the Martyrs. Some of y'all may be acquainted with Voice of the Martyrs. Um, it was started by a man named Richard Wormbrand, W-U-R-M-B-R-A-N-D. He was from Romania. And yesterday, February the 29th, marked 72 years to the day since he was abducted over in Romania. I don't know that much about his pre-Christian life. He does share in this film, because it was an hour long, and in fact, I've ordered a copy of it, but I want to show a church. And folks, I want you as a congregation to see it. I don't care when we see it. I don't care if it's a Sunday morning or Sunday night, whatever it takes. It does take an hour to watch. But Richard, Richard Warmbrand wasn't always a Christian. He was not raised in a Christian home. But he came to know Christ and he became passionate that other people come to know Jesus Christ. Um, when he was a young man, this was back in the uh, 1940s, Russia invaded Romania, and they basically outlawed all forms of Christianity. Richard Wormbrand got arrested, and he actually spent 14 years of his life in prison. The movie itself starts out very disturbing. I'll, I'll tell you this much ahead of time. It's not necessarily gory, but there are some very painful scenes in there. It starts off with them having Richard Wormbrand torturing him because he's a Christian. They have his hands shackled and his feet shackled, and they're actually he's kind of in a hanging position with his feet exposed toward a man who was there taking clubs and beating his feet. And they show that scene a couple different times. And all that they're wanting Richard Wormbrand to do is to tell who the other Christians are. And he refuses to do it because he loves his brothers and sisters. His wife even gets put in a prison camp. And I, I, I say that I want you as a church to watch it because it points out, I know some people say, well, this happened back during World War II. No, this is still going on around the world today. 
And you and I don't realize how blessed we are to have the religious freedom we have. The only crime that Richard Wormbrand did is that he believes, as we do, that there is a God. And this God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins and we could live forever. The question was raised in Sunday school class, why, why, why do they care about Christians? Because when you're dealing with a communist state, they don't want to acknowledge anybody as being supreme except the government. And Christians cannot violate that. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this government is not supreme. We know that there is one who is supreme, and one day we're going to give an account to him. So I really want our church to end up watching it. But Richard Wernbrand wanted people to come to know Jesus Christ. And so the message that I preached to you this morning may be a simple message for most of our congregation, most of our congregation. In fact, everybody here may be saved. I don't know. But my prayer is that you might know the simplicity of getting saved. Because I tell you this much, your eternal destiny rests upon what you do. Jesus Christ. To accept Jesus Christ, Jesus says, is to receive the gift of eternal life. To reject him is to face the judgment of God and run the risk of being separated eternally. I'm going to use this passage of scripture if I have time. I'm also going to go over to Romans chapter 10. I know that we've got the Lord's Supper, so I don't want to go too long. So what is the story from John chapter 3? Many times as you watch the ball games, especially the football games, you used to see up in the stands behind the goalpost, some guy would end up having a sign that said what? 316. John 3.16. Makes you wonder how many people see that and they have no idea what John 3.16 is about. You folks know what John 3.16 is about, don't you? What is John 3.16? For God love the world you really believe it's possible that you and I can live forever? Yes. Absolutely. I, I maybe shouldn't take time to digress here. My aunt sent me an email this past week talking about the pyramids over in Egypt. The person that was doing it brought out some stuff about the pyramids that I'd never heard before, but the guy was just absolutely amazed at what the Egyptians were able to do with the pyramids back during the time that they lived. I mean, just the complexity of them, the size of the stones. You've seen pictures and so on and so forth. How in the world anybody during that time period managed to put together something like that? And I text her back, I says, well, I too am amazed. I mean, it is impressive what they're able to do, but I says, I'd really get a little bit upset with the scientific community that they can see that that pyramid didn't just evolve, right? I mean, when you see a pyramid, did you say, well, it just happened to turn out like that. It was purely an act of evolution. Is that, is that what you say when you see the pyramids? No, you end up saying, there's some sort of genius behind it. Well, the same is true with us. When I look at, at life, I see genius. I watched this past week, not that you're very interested in what I watch on YouTube, but what I ended up watching was about a six-minute video of a salamander. <laughs> it's like, man, you're, you're bored. You've got six minutes to watch it. It started with where a salamander came from. It started from a single cell, and then it showed as that thing multiplied inside that egg sac, and it slowly formed into a salamander. Now, as I'm watching that, I'm thinking to myself, it's the same process that we go through as people. Most people end up looking at people and end up thinking they're just people. You, you do realize that you just started a single cell. And what that particular video showed was that you had a single cell becoming two cells, and then the two cells becoming four cells, and it shows this thing, and it's nothing but globs of stuff, it seems like, but there is order behind it all. There is this complex thing, life, that's, making this thing become what we are. And when you look around us, you see evidence of, at least in my mind, the divine creator. I've told you folks recently within the messages, we're all made out of what? Dirt. Dirt. 
What do I call you folks? <laughs> dirt bags. <laughs> You're all just a bunch of dirt bags. I think the only pastor in America to call these congregations dirt bags. But I'm serious. Everything, we're made out of dirt. What are dogs made out of? Dirt. Cows? Dirt. Birds? Dirt. Trees? Dirt. Plants? Dirt. Flowers? Dirt. Everything that you see here is made out of dirt. Now, here's where I'm going with this. When you and I begin to see what God was able to do with dirt, and even when you look at your body, you look at the membranes inside of your eye, made out of dirt. How in the world do you do? How do you make that stuff out of dirt? Do you serve a God that ends up doing that? Do you think you serve a God that can make you live forever? My faith is willing to take the next step and say, if God can end up doing that, there is no limit to what my God can do. And Jesus came down here, and he started performing miracles. Now, and when you read the Gospel of John, the only miracle that's been performed, that, that's recorded, it's not the only one that he's done, because there were other ones that were done. But in John chapter 2, there is the miracle of turning water into wine. But there were other miracles, because in John chapter 3, there's a man named Nicodemus, and he comes to Jesus and says, we know that you must be a person sent from God, because nobody could do the sort of things that you're doing. And I think that he's referring more than just turning water into wine. We know that nobody could do the things that you're doing except God is with you. And I'm condensing this conversation, but you can read it for yourself in John chapter 3. But Jesus ends up saying to John, to uh, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, by the way, is a very religious man. And I, I will make a kind of a side comment here. Nicodemus was very much aware that just being religious wasn't cutting it. And I'll tell you this much, being a religious person never will cut it. What do I mean by religious? Well, if you were a Pharisee, I mean there were all sorts of rules and regulations. You know what? Life is not about living by rules and regulations. It's about living in this relationship with God in which you know a person, not just a set of laws. You actually know a person. And Nicodemus, I believe, when he came to Jesus at night, was searching because there was something empty in his faith. And he comes to Jesus and he says, there's something different about you. And Jesus basically cuts to the chase and he ends up saying to Nicodemus something that all of us need to hear. If you really want to live forever, you need to be born again. You need to be born again. And we hear that, that term, and it's like, what does it mean? Nicodemus felt the same way. What does it mean to be born again? Do you ever sometimes wish that you could go back in life and undo all the bad stuff and kind of start again? You miss doing all the bad stuff? Wouldn't you like to be born again and try again? Wouldn't you like that? And Jesus says to Nicodemus, hey, Nicodemus, that's what needs to happen to you. And Nicodemus says, how in the world could I be born again? Could I go back inside my mom and come out again? Jesus says, no, I'm not talking about the flesh. You see, the problem isn't so much with the flesh. The problem is with what's inside the flesh. It's what's going on inside your heart. Rather than living to do what you want to do, you need to start living to do what God wants you to do. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Jesus says to Nicodemus, this is kind of a side note, you can read this for yourself in John chapter 3. When you get to talking about the flesh, that's one thing, Nicodemus, but I'm not talking about the flesh, I'm talking about the spirit of a person. And then Jesus uses an illustration to talk about the spirit of the person. He says it's like the wind. When you're looking outside, do you actually see the wind? No, <coughs> you don't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. He said that's how it is with a person that is born again by the Spirit of God. 
the Spirit of God begins to move upon that person. And that person starts kind of what we, we would say is marching to the beat of a different drummer. Have you ever noticed somebody that they sometimes will say, that person got religion? I pray that that person be, didn't get religion. I pray that that person got a relationship. Because when we sing the song in the garden, that he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. It's talking about this relationship that you establish with God through Jesus Christ. When Jesus came and died on the cross, he came to establish a new relationship between you and God in which you acknowledge that God is Lord of all. And you want to live to please him. And it led to Jesus ending up saying the most famous verse of scripture in all of God's word, the verse that y'all quoted. Hey Nicodemus, God really does so love the world <coughs> that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. When you read the miracles of Jesus, you know why Jesus did the miracles? Some of them say, well, Jesus just wanted to help the person get well. There's an element of truth to that. Jesus wanted the person to get well. But I'll tell you a far greater reason why Jesus did the miracles. He wanted people to believe in him. I don't care if it was fixing a problem at a wedding in which they ran out of, you know, wine for the wedding. I don't care if it was a a lame man that could never walk in his life that Jesus ended up giving him the ability to walk. I don't care if it was hungry people that Jesus ended up filled. What Jesus wanted to do with people was to get people to believe in him. Why? Because Jesus says in John 3, 16, God so loves this world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Isn't it good news? That you and I don't have to work for our salvation. People say, well then, why do you try to do good things afterwards? Out of gratitude. I can't earn my way into heaven. Jesus is the one that had to pay for my admission. I acknowledge that Jesus is the one that gets me into heaven. Everything that I do is just to please him and to thank him. It does not pay one bit of my debt. Jesus paid it all. And I believe in Jesus. It's as simple as saying, you know what, Jesus? I believe in you. One of the touching scenes, I don't want to give a whole lot away about that movie. Richard Wormbrand got put into a, a war while he was in prison because he had a bad case of tuberculosis. And they actually put him in a section of the prison called Room 4 that nobody ever came out of. But guess what Richard Wormbrand did? While he was in Room Number 4, he saw countless people on their deathbed who did the simple thing of saying, Lord Jesus, I believe. Did those guys have a chance to do anything good with their life? No, they didn't. But they were saved because they believed. And I believe that that's the way that a person gets saved. That you and I come to Jesus Christ and we acknowledge, you know what, Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that if there's anybody in the world that could get me to heaven, it's you. And I am trusting you 100% with my going to heaven. That's what a Christian is. Somebody that knows we don't belong in heaven, but Jesus made it possible. You know, a lot of people, they don't pay much attention to the next two verses. They know the 16th verse, but they won't pay attention to the 17th verse. The 17th verse says, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. And then what I think is maybe the most powerful of all verses, Jesus says, he that believeth on the Son is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. My prayer as a pastor is that everybody might believe in Jesus because in my heart I believe that we all need Jesus. That's why we come to church this morning. We believe in Jesus. Do we believe in God? Oh yes, we believe in God. But we believe that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. This morning as we share together in the Lord's Supper, it's a reminder to us that we believe in the Son of God. We believe that it was his body and his blood that he gave for the salvation. I pray that if you don't know Jesus Christ, that you might believe in Jesus. I'm like the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1. We studied it in our Sunday school class this morning. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will always give thanks to God that he helped me enough that he gave his son for my salvation. When I was seven or eight years of age, I ended up saying, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. And I ask you to come in my heart and forgive me my sins. I give you my life. And I know beyond a shadow of doubt, Jesus saved me. And Jesus keeps me. And he will you too, shall we pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we can't thank you enough. That you loved us enough. There's no way, I'll say this honestly, there's no way that I would have gone through what you went through for even a good person. But you did it for me in my sinful condition because you wanted me to go to heaven. How could I, how could I refuse the gift that you gave? I couldn't. And I pray that nobody else will be able to as well. That Father, everybody might come to believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your sacrifice for us, Lord. We pray that you might help us to always live for you and share the good news. Not only does God love us, but God's Son, Jesus, saves us. Use this message in our lives. If there's any here that have never given their heart to Jesus, may they do so this day. And they become part of your family. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray.